out with my hands, I'm going to move the water. I don't think we want to say, oh my gosh, look what happened. But I'm glad that you're here today. And so that we'll have time for Q&A, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Roll call. George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Atiana Jefferson, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Philando Castile, Brianna Taylor, and the list goes on and on. Unfortunately, the list has not stopped growing. Is this the America we want to call home? According to statistics, the NAACP examined, although black people make up 13.4% of the population, we make up 22% of fatal police shootings, 47% of wrongful conviction exonerations, 35% of individuals executed by the death penalty. Black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at five times the rate of whites. Black men face disproportionately harsh incarceration experiences as compared with prisoners of other races. Racial disparities are also noticeable with black youth as evident by the school to prison pipeline and higher rates of incarceration of black youth. These data and other alarming statistics, I only pulled out a few, they are available on the NAACP's website in its criminal, criminal justice fact sheet. I ask you to go look at that later on. Although these are national statistics, I'm sure you could find similar data in Knoxville and Knox County. Unaddressed racism, systematic racism is in my mind, the most important issue in the United States today. And it has been since before the founding of our nation. So many of our ills can be traced back to slavery and we have yet to right that wrong. We've passed legislation, we've put up Black Lives Matter signs, but what about in our hearts, our values, and our policies as individually and collectively in our workplace. Now, I want to pause and applaud the Knoxville Bar Association for presenting this series on difficult, critical conversations. You are addressing race, racism, equity, and I applaud you for that. I applaud you individually for being here today. You stepped away from whatever you were doing to be here today. But continued inaction is simply unacceptable. Now, before getting to the meat of today's session, I want to share a portion of a transcript by Jane Elliott as she was speaking on race being Black in America. Now, Jane Elliott is a white woman who for years has, has practiced education on race. You may remember, you know, back in the 60s or 70s where she did the blue eye, brown eye, 
collar, you know, on all, collar off with elementary school children. But she was at this particular speech, she was speaking to an auditorium full of people. And she said, I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens, if you will. As a white person, would you be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society? If so, please stand up. There was total silence. So she said, you didn't understand the directions. If white folks want to be treated the way black folks are in this society, stand up. Again, there was total silence. After reflecting a moment, she said, nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. So I don't know why you are so willing to accept it or allow it to happen for others. I want you to pause and think about that for a moment. If it's something you don't want, why are you content with others having it? Well, the purpose of today's session is for us to discuss, number one, the importance of having these conversations. Number two, how you can bring your best to each session. And number three, how you can get the most out of each session. Let's begin by defining what in the world is a critical conversation. A critical conversation is a discussion between two or more people where number one, the stakes are high. There is a risk that something seriously bad can happen if you don't address the issue. That makes it a critical conversation. In your case, perhaps there's a risk of losing a client, missing a major deadline, delivering low quality work because you don't have all the appropriate skill sets. In other words, there is some serious risk that needs to be addressed. Number two, opinions differ. If you're having a critical conversation, the party's opinions are different and you're likely, guess what? Expecting the other person to change. Although that happens sometimes, change is not one-sided. You have to be open to listen. Let me say that again. You have to be open to listen and truly consider different opinions. Now I know that in law school, each of you were trained to listen for that famous comeback so you can win your argument. But I'm talking about a different purpose of listening. One where you acknowledge that you might be wrong and can learn from someone else. After all, maybe you are the one who needs to change. Emotions run strong. In difficult conversations, you're not just bringing your words to the table. You're bringing your feelings, your emotions, but you cannot be successful unless you check your emotions. If it means taking a breath, stepping away for a minute, 
don't bring those high caliber emotions to a conversation. It will just escalate and you won't hear words. You'll only be experiencing feelings. The outcomes are significantly impacts lives. What do you think would happen if things kept going the same way they were, if you didn't address the issues? Nothing would change, things will stay the same. And that will send a signal that you or your firm are okay with the way things are and don't wanna change. Yet the need for change is there. So that's why it's important that you have these critical conversations. There is a significant risk of negative consequences. You know what? You could lose clients. You could lose good employees. The bottom line is you could lose money as other firms are addressing these issues and they're reaping the benefits. So there could be negative consequences for continuing the way that you are. And not having these conversations leaves that big elephant in the room and it's time for him to go. Action is needed from all parties. Now you say, what is that big elephant in the room? Well, that big elephant that we've been annoying all these years or even worse, we know about it, but we're putting blinders on and pretending we don't see. That is racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You, your law firms, and your profession as a whole are at greater risk by continuing to ignore DEI than you are by taking the risk of having these conversations and making a change. You are at greater risk by continuing to ignore than taking the risk of addressing the issues and making a change. So let's talk a little bit about why you should have these conversations. Number one, it's the right and moral thing to do. And it makes good business sense. Diversity in all profession is extremely important and the legal profession is no exception. You know, in the days when the great majority of customers for legal services were white, male, middle-class, who attended similar colleges and universities as you, it may have made sense for the people providing services to look like their clients. But the world has changed. You now find yourselves in meetings with potential clients from all over the globe and from backgrounds far different from yours. So what has worked in the past will not continue to work in the future. Your firm needs to be able to attract all potential clients if you wanna to continue to be successful. Let's talk about how to bring about that change I'm talking about. First of all, you want to start off by ensuring you have a diverse staff. Guess what? Diverse lawyers bring diverse opinions and those diverse opinions make better decisions. When brought together, individuals from different walks of life can compare those experiences and build on each other's strength. You don't get stronger by leaving out pieces of the puzzle. After all, the best talent 
is the best talent. No matter what that talent looks like, no matter where that talent was educated, and no matter how that talent sounds, you need to reevaluate your traditional methods of selecting that next employee. Now, don't pat yourself on the back and give yourself a check mark if you increase diversity in hiring. Don't stop there. Ensure diversity is throughout your organization. And when new hires come in and they see people who look like them in senior positions, the brightest and the best will stay around to emulate them with the expectations that they will go into senior levels as well. I wanna stop and tell you a little bit about my first job out of college. Now, I didn't take the traditional route to college. I was what was called a co-op student, which meant every other quarter I was working in the workforce as opposed to being in the classroom setting. And I chose to do that because I learned a lot about application. So when I went back to class, uh, to courses, I can apply how what I'm learning in school can be used in the workforce. I would not change anything from that for that experience. I had several job offers, but I chose one locally. And when I interviewed for that job, they applauded me for what I brought to the table, said I was not just a regular college graduate. I could hit the ground running, running because of that experience. And they would compensate me for it. But like a lot of companies, don't talk about salaries to anybody. Well, after a few months on the job, I talked to other recently college graduate hires. They were offered the same that I was. The black females were. The white males, no experience, college graduate uh, education, were offered more. So once I figured that out, I immediately start looking for another job. So when I found another job, I resigned and I told them why I was resigning. And immediately, oh, we, we had a promotion. We would get ready to give you your paperwork. We, it, just if give us another week, we would have had it ready. And then they start telling me what new projects they were gonna give me if I stayed on. They were really wooing me to stay on. But trust had been broken by then. So you can't stay anywhere you don't trust. And so I left that position. And, but think about what it costs to bring in any new employee. It costs recruitment, you know, the orientation, all of that. It was lost simply because they didn't value me. They weren't honest about why they were hiring me. And so you have to be careful. My point is that ensure your employees have equitable career paths and that you're honest about expectations about what you expect them to do and compensate them. Compensate them. It's not good enough to have the check mark, look at my diverse staff. If the diverse staff is making far less than everyone else, and the career path is not obvious for them. You've wasted your money and time in making that higher. You know, people are realizing their power and they are prioritizing their well being. If they can't bring their whole self to an organization, if they can't believe that they are a valued employee, they will not stay long. Can you afford to lose good employees? No. And then the last thing to do to bring about change is welcome all clients. 
What firm in here, I'm gonna do a Jane Elliott. Please raise your hand. You don't have to stand up if you don't want new clients. <laughs> you don't want new clients, stand up. But you know what? New clients are expecting and appreciate diversity in the workforce. Those who attended the session last week with uh, Cornell Kennedy, he shared how his firm had lost bids because the client was expecting them, whoever got the bid, to have a larger diversity quota. You know, this is a serious matter. People are now looking at firms which they want to do business with and are expecting more diversity. Now, clients want competent service providers, but they want confident service providers who make them feel comfortable, who understand their needs. So having service providers who look like the clients, who have some, some experiences like the clients have, that generates a level of trust. And you need to have that trust in order to partner with your clients on behalf of them. So having attorneys and other staffs from different backgrounds will make you more attractive to a larger pool of clients. And as a whole, people of color begin to recognize their self-worth. You know, we are no longer saying, oh, well, I have to sell whatever. I got, we know that, that we are valuable and we're no longer just taking whatever's thrown at us. You know, look what happened in the November elections in Georgia. For the first time, people of color believed that they could make a difference, that their vote mattered to the point that they stood in long lines to cast that ballot and it flipped the, the Senate, it flipped what was happening. The result is a lot of other people saw that and thought, hmm, maybe I do matter. Maybe that's just not a sign in my yard. Maybe what I do and bring to the community is important. I've shared with you some of the whys. Now let's talk about the hows. And I wanna guide you through some tips so that when you continue these conversations, you will be more successful. Number one, assume you have something to learn. Enter every session with an open mind. I know it's hard, you're bright, intelligent people, but you don't know it all. And there is something you can learn. These sessions that are being put together for you are not a waste of time. Define the issue. Each topic is going to have a different issue. Don't mix them up, don't confuse them. Stay with the topic on hand at each session so that you can get the most out of that one. Understand its impact on you. Don't necessarily always look at what, how this is impacting everyone else. Think about how you're impacted by the subject matter. Think about what will happen if you do something different about what you're learning. Understand the reasons for the discussions. There are reasons why all of these topics have been picked. Understand what they are. And understand the impact on others. You know, racism didn't happen overnight. And these specific topics you're gonna to talk about, guess what? They didn't happen last night. <laughs> They've been around for a while. So realize that some of you will come to these conversations afraid of what you might lose if you participate. 
if you share your thoughts, if you share your experiences. On the other hand, others will come to these conversations just fed up with what they've experienced and they believe they've been denied opportunities. Don't you see where these two are different? These two positions are totally different. Therefore, you won't be the only one uncomfortable. <laughs> Everybody is uncomfortable when you talk about things that we put under the cover, hid under the rug for so long. They are difficult conversations, but you they are necessary and you will gain from participating. I want you to enter into those conversations with empathy and compassion. I encourage you to openly express your feelings and experiences. Don't back off. Create that safe environment where you can openly express your experiences. But I encourage you to listen to others and imagine how they are feeling. Just take for a moment and think, hmm, I had never thought about it in that perspective. Now, because it's different from mine. You know, we all have different experiences. Nobody had the same. I mean, even siblings brought up in the same house had different playmates, different teachers in school. So we all have different experiences. So be willing to listen to what people bring to the conversation. And guess what? Begin each conversation with a smile. And you're probably saying, what difference does that make? After all, with masks, nobody can see if I'm smiling or not. <laughs> but the bottom line is, think about this. Your attitude impacts the outcome. I know you, like I have, have walked in experiences knowing how things are going to turn out. Guess what? I drive them that way. That may not have been the only way that experience could have turn, turned out, but because I had that preconceived idea what it was going to happen, and most of the time it, wasn't, it was negative, not positive, I had a negative experience, and guess what? Nothing happened beneficial. So that's why I say begin with a smile. Begin with the expectations that I'm going to learn, I'm going to grow. Other people participating are going to learn. They're going to grow. And the end result is we're going to have a positive experience by being together in this space discussing this issue. How to be your best during the conversation. Now, that was sort of like preparation. How to be your best while you're doing it. Number one, be sincere. Leave that pretense at the door. No one, this is not a job for acting. This is a time to be yourself. Be present in the conversation. You know, not just show up and warm a seat. You have to actively participate, share your ideas, listen, but don't just show up with a check mark, fill a seat and go back being the same way you were before you came in. Be confident, not arrogant. <laughs> there is a difference. You know, be confident in your position and your experiences because they're yours. So be confident in them. But don't be so arrogant that you want to make people think this is the only way to be. That doesn't help the situation at all. We talked about empathy, but be empathetic. Again, put yourself in the other person's place. It's so important for you to grow and for, for everybody to grow and move forward. We've got to appreciate that my experiences are my experiences. And so try to put yourself, if I had done what they did, 
I would be doing something different. And that is one of the things that I've learned over the years that when I heard other people's stories, I said, oh my gosh, why am I expecting them to act like me when they don't have the same experiences that I have? And had I had theirs, I would be totally different because I better now understand why they are what they are. Be honest with yourself and with others. These conversations, not the time to pretend you're somebody else. Create that environment where honesty matters, where it's safe to say what you think, what you feel, what you experience. That elephant will never leave the room if we don't talk about it in an honest way. Well, we're at preparation. I've got homework for you to do before every session. First of all, I want you to ask yourself, is there a race problem in this country? Is there a race problem in Knoxville? From your perspective, if there is a problem, ask yourself, what are you doing to correct the wrongs? What have you done to contribute to the problem? If there is not a problem in your opinion, why not? And think about those things before your next session to help you participate and better engage in dialogue. And are you contributing to the race problem? Are you actively breaking down barriers? You know, if you're white, how do you treat and interact people of color? If you're a person of color, how do you treat and interact with white people? You know, how does your firm interact with people of color? Do you treat clients differently? If not, why? No, why? If I don't, why? If I do, why? In other words, what are your reasons for believing it is necessary to interact with clients differently if you believe that they are? I think that's all. So anyway, the, the last thing I wanted to share with you is part of the success or failure of these conversations will rely on your ability to assess your, assess your own situation. So between sessions, talk to your family. Talk to your friends, have these conversations. When you have people you hang out with, shape your thoughts. Have these conversations with them. Think about how you personally benefited from the current system. Has the, think about has the system worked against you and in so what ways? How has your privilege or lack of privilege impacted you? You know, each person needs to evaluate for themselves and have, you know, real frank discussions so that you can open up your mind, open up your thoughts, and collectively make a change. You know, recent tragedies have caused our nation to experience unprecedented civil unrest. And we've reached that inflection point. Justice and fairness are all fundamental cornerstones of our nation. You know that better than anybody. Yet, it's not there. So it's important that you continue these conversations. Our nation as a whole is having these conversations. But use this time to reflect and ask, where does the Knoxville so Bar Association stand on these issues? And where do I individually stand? If you don't like the answers, this is a perfect opportunity to change those answers. 
And keep in mind, this is not a worn and done, check the mark, I attended training. You know, some of those trainings are like that. Okay, I did, I, okay, I got it. This is not one of those. The training should help bring about culture change and creating an environment where everyone truly feels like they belong. Your success or failure is dependent on you, how much honesty you bring to the table, how courageous you will be in addressing these issues. So best wishes for much success. I am counting on you to make a difference because my expectations is we're gonna have some awesome results. Okay. Okay.